good time of day, guys. My name is Godzi, and welcome back to another episode of Higurashi When They Cry, Chapter 8, Matsuri Bayashi. I am very tired. Um, <laughs> I just hope I don't dissociate while reading today, because sometimes I do that, you know? I try not to, but it just sort of happens, and then I'm like, wait, what did I read? Yeah, uh, <laughs> anyways. Last episode, we finally finished the fragments for real, for real. And Akasaka regretted not going back to save Rika. And then, well, more so not going back to save his uh, wife. Were they married at that point? Or engaged? One or the other, doesn't matter. Uh, save, her name's Yukie, right? I, I think that was her name. Uh, so he regretted that, and then also regretted not saving Rika. And we fast forwarded. Uh, from 1985 to 1983, because that's how this game is, and <laughs> Hanyu is now visible to people and going to school. Yeah, <laughs> I I'm kind of downplaying the importance of that, but be that's because I don't know what words to use to make it sound important. She's trying to make a miracle happen by believing, I guess, in this game's words. Anyways, I was told in a comment last episode that regarding Hanyu sprites, it's just the console version, the sprite set that I'm using, that makes Hanyu look older than Rika. So, that's a weird choice, but whatever. Uh, cause I definitely don't remember her being that tall, and I, I guess that just means, yeah, she's not, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> and then second off, uh, the part with the narration that was confusing the shit out of me, where it was like switching to Keiichi's perspective, and then into third person, I think? Um, I still don't really know for sure, but, like, Keiichi was on screen, everyone's sprites were on screen, so I would assume it's third person, unless it was Keiichi the whole time. It, it was just super confusing, and I I'm guessing a mistake on Ryukishi's part. Uh, another one of those moments where it's like, yeah, he needs an editor, has said in the comment, too, so, yeah. Anyways, let's continue. Hotel employee, okay. Okay, this is the banquet section. Can you hear me? One more speech and then we'll move on to a toast. Are you ready? This is the back end. We're ready. We can't hear anything from inside, so please give us a cue when the speech is finishing up. Ten bottles per table, okay? Make sure you serve your table smoothly. Are we... I... This scene seems familiar, honestly. Young waiters with bow ties got bottles of beer ready for a toast. Good for them. <laughs> there are several dozen tables with white tablecloths on them in the banquet room. Approximately eight people are sitting at each table, so there are at least a few hundred people there. The banquet room is teeming with excitement. There are many plates with different kinds of food on each table. A sushi platter, a sashimi platter, a fruit platter. Also along the wall, there are cooks ready to serve fresh sashimi. Yeah. All the guests appear to be well-mannered gentlemen, and obviously, they are notable people from different fields. The huge and beautiful chandelier above them clearly tells that this hotel holds a status good enough for those famous people. An elderly gentleman is giving a long speech on the stage before making a toast. Usually, people don't like such long speeches, especially if it's before a toast. But the guests are actually excited with his speech. Well, maybe fervor was a pleasant way to put it. It was probably more accurate to say their excitement was bizarre. Anyway, Japan accepted a demand for unconditional surrender, and the day they did, the Pacific War ended. In other words, even if they had to take care of further business, the war ended that day according to international law. And from that day on, there was peace. Therefore, if any troops invaded Japanese land during that peace, that would be an encroachment against Japan. Yeah, fucking... <laughs> if they invaded Japan, that would be an encroachment against Japan. Old people are great. No matter what the Soviet Union says, the Northern Territories are Japanese land, and it should be clear to everyone that they invaded illegally. Here, here. And now they want to settle by returning a mere two islands to us? Who do they think they're kidding? Listen, Habomai, Shikotan, Kunash Kunashir, and Iturup are Japanese territory. You know, I'll, I'll give you the first two. 
but the other two sound like Russian names, I'm not gonna lie. Of course, that doesn't mean you don't technically own them. The United States owns Puerto Rico, after all, but we don't have an official language, so... Doesn't really matter, fucking New Mexico. Look at, look at us go, you know? <laughs> Their total area is, a, is equal to an entire prefecture. What would you think if the Soviets invaded and occupied one of our prefectures? Would you settle for just getting half of the prefecture back? No, you wouldn't! You'd have the entirety returned to you! Are prefectures specific sizes in Japan? Like, they're divided up based on how much land it covers? Because <laughs> that sounds very complicated, honestly. I mean, I, that, I'm just, you know. I live in the United States where nothing makes sense. We've got Alaska and Texas, and then we've got fucking Rhode Island and Delaware. And then other fucking weird states, like... South Dakota. I don't fucking know. <laughs> uh, no, you wouldn't! You'd have the entirety returned to you. Yet the Soviets are brazenly- brazenly- Fuck, sitting there claiming vested rights to the land. This is no joke! We must strongly oppose this to the bitter end. Return all the Northern Islands! Our nation must demonstrate unwavering resolve on that point! Thunderous applause filled the banquet room. All the gentlemen agreed, and expressed that they felt the same way by cheering him on. In all that hubbub, there were two people standing by the wall who didn't seem to fit in with the rest, and these are characters we already know. They were wearing sharp-looking suits, and while a little too old to be called young men, were certainly young compared to all the elderly gentlemen in the banquet room. Never mind, we don't know them. <laughs> Nimi. Although it sounds familiar. Why do politicians always tend to re lean right or nationalist-based, and be so partisan? Okay, we know Akasaka. That's simple. What politicians want most are votes. And votes are cast by their constituents. But not everyone over 20 actually votes. Is the voting age in Japan 20? I guess that makes sense. It's the adult age, or whatever. Voter turnout is highest amongst those who are retired and have free time. So the elderly interested in politics monopolize the votes. Huh, the same as in the states, more or less. Na name me one young person who came to their own conclusion that Lindsey Graham is fit to be in office, you know? And that means the key to their election is whether or not they can secure the elderly vote. The war only happened 40 years ago. In other words, the generation that's interested in voting is the generation from before the war. My mother talks about air raids often. She used to live near Suidobashi. She lost all of her family in an air raid. She had to walk across the burnt fields all alone. That's right. Our parents went through the war. They shed their blood, sweat, and tears, believing it was for the good of the nation. We lost the war, but they believe the war still brought about change that serves as a foundation for the peace we have today. Ah, I hear that a lot. That if Japan hadn't fought in the war, the Asian countries would still be Western colonies. There was no way we could have won, but we needed to fight in that war, or something like that. In that case, no matter how much they preach pacifism, politicians can't ignore the pre-war generation. War is bad, and we should never again fight a war. But that war was necessary. Unless they say things like that, it's like they're denying the very lives that generation lived. I see. Politicians have to work hard to earn votes, huh? That's one sentence. It's just like, war is bad, but not for this one that you guys like. Like, that's all you have to say. <laughs> However, it would be one thing if they were truly proclaiming their own beliefs, but... Many of them are simply saying that to get elected. As long as there are politicians trying to win over what remains of the pre-war generation, this country's post-war era will never end. You know, I feel like I'm gonna say a lot of- give a lot of political takes this episode, just like that, uh... One episode of Mina Garoshi where Keiichi was yelling. Was it the Kimiyoshi one or the Mario one? I think it was the Kimiyoshi one where he was yelling at Kimiyoshi. Yeah, because I was like, why do old people care this much about dumb shit? But yeah, I want to bring up something kind of vaguely because I don't want to say exactly where I live. But this dumb fuck, <laughs> this dumb fuck who lives in my town is running for county legislator. Uh. She's not a very smart person at all. One of her kids, I, I went to high school with him, and he was 
an interesting fella. Not super fucking unhinged, but his mom sure is, and so is his older brother. Um, but regardless, she's gonna fucking win, because she's running as a Republican, only opposed by a Democrat, and I'm- and the county I live in is very fucking red, so... That's fun, that's great and cool. And the funny part is she sent a postcard in the mail to every household that had registered Republicans in it because my parents and brother are registered Republicans. Less because they're fucking insane and more because, well, our town is red and they want to be able to vote in local elections. I personally don't care as far as that goes. I'd rather vote in the primaries and shit because New York's a fucking weird state and doesn't have open caucuses. But whatever. Um... So she sent a postcard in the mail, so we got one at our house, and it's like just a bullet list of her campaign promises, because, you know, pop political shit, and she's like, I will fight to uphold conservative values, so, you know, fucking dumb shit, she's, she's like the Marjorie Taylor Greene of my town, let's be real, uh, but then the last bullet on the list was, we'll fight for your values, and I'm like, this bitch lying, <laughs> like, I know this isn't meant for me, but will fight for conservative values and will fight for my beliefs. You know, that contradicts each other a little bit. Just a wee bit. I was about to say her fucking name, but then it'd be real easy to find out which county I live in, but I ain't saying that, but regardless, well, maybe that's enough info to figure out what county I live in anyways, but don't look me up. I don't want people to know where I live. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's continue. That's how the ghosts of the war will pass their, their will on to the next generation, and keep things the same for the next millennium. They'll just keep repeating that the war was justified, yet regrettable every time an election takes place. When will our country ever be freed from that cycle? It's simple. Young people need to vote. Don't be fooled by war stories. Vote for those actually pushing policies, based. Realistic policies, that is, not based. Ah, yeah. There are a few who talk about some pretty unrealistic things. <laughs> such as... Such as... Nimi? Do we need to beat up some fucking... What would they be? They'd be boomers, wouldn't they? You guys are how old? In... In the 80s? You're fucking... 30? I'm guessing? 35-ish? So that would mean I can do math. If it's 83, I don't, I don't fucking know. Or maybe we're back in 85 again. Do the math. Let's just use 85 as a baseline because it's easier. I can't do math. 1950. Yeah, you guys are boomers. <laughs> what? Well, okay. Tell me. Do I have to beat up some boomers? Do I? Do I? Whatever. Aha. akasaka -san. Isn't that the F table? There she is. Let's go. The speech had ended and the elderly gentlemen were giving the man on the stage a standing ovation. The two men walked through the crowd and approached an old lady in a kimono. Yes, that would be me, but who are you? I made an appointment with you on the phone yesterday. I'm Akasaka. Okay. And that's the whole scene? No, okay, we're somewhere else. So, yes, but no. Oh! Oh! <laughs> Oh, she's crying! <laughs> I thought she was interested. Oh, <laughs> my husband works so hard for this country! <laughs> even so, even so! Madam, I understand what you're going through. This wasn't really anything out of the ordinary. Nobody could remember if there had been a donation or not. So a handful of politicians were questioned. As a result, some came up with a scheme to blame a sickly elderly man who had already retired. With only a short time to live anyway, he was the perfect fit for them. The elderly man had already been sick in bed, and the shock of his friends betraying him had taken away his will to live. Rude. The only thing his wife could do was to simply watch him suffer. She kept crying while telling the men about her husband's achievements. If your husband is in fact innocent, a judge will rule accordingly. Don't worry. All false accusations will be cleared. I already know that! Because he is innocent! But he won't live to see the verdict! He worked so hard for this country! And this is what he gets in return at the end? How can he rest in peace? 
Akasaka nodded and tried to find the right words to say to her. His colleague rummaged through a pile of paperwork behind him. The papers were filled with fine print, and be hard for an onlooker to tell exactly what they were. However, the way he was looking at them made it very clear that they contained something important. Takasaka-san, this is amazing! This records exactly how the money was moved! Akasaka gave him a signal to remind him that this wasn't the place to be looking through those documents. Madam, there isn't any more paperwork, is there? No. That was the only thing in his safe. Please, use it to get back at those ungrateful bastards! My husband did so much for them, and yet they... Oh! Madam, you do understand that some things in these documents will implicate him, don't you? Yes, I understand that. One can't be honest all the time when one is a politician. I am his wife, after all. Thank you for your cooperation. I will use this to expose the injustice that was done to him. Only one thing. May I ask you just one thing, though? Could you wait until my husband passes away before making this public? Hmm. <laughs> the paperwork Akasaka received was something her husband intended to take to the grave with him. Something that shouldn't exist in this world. If it went public, her husband's name would be disgraced. Akasaka nodded. I understand. You have my word. Okay. Vast public funds were moving from Kasumi Gaseki. The funds were issued to sub-branches to carry out national policies. But various ideas over those public funds always came together. And there was never an end to those trying to poke a straw into it to suck it out like a mosquito. Excess dividends, cordial patronage, profits for organizations that benefited themselves. Many financiers? Financiers? approached and adhered to officials and politicians hoping to earn those gains. And the bureaucrats constantly indulged them. That's how Japanese corruption works. These illegal pipes form bypass after bypass in Kasumi Gaseki, siphoning off public funds for their profit. To find and destroy such pipes is, of course, in the national interest. But eliminating illegal ex expenditures isn't as simple as all that. There are important people connected to those pipes, and when those people are investigated, a major political scandal takes place. The reason why the government doesn't investigate such illegal ex expenditures is not only to protect vested interests, but also because they are conscious to the damage these scandals can cause politically. To put it more succinctly, the government can't endure the pain of pushing pus out of a wound. The closer the exposed subject is to the top, the greater the pain faced by the government, and that affects the cabinet approval rating. The closer the subject is to the core, the more extensive the damage to the heart. The secret investigation Akasaka was leading went as close to the heart as it got, and, would cause a and could cause a collapse of the administration from shock. Akasaka was tipped off that a huge amount of public funding was leaking out through an alumni organization of the seven imperial universities, so he and his colleagues had been conducting a secret investigation into the matter for a long time. His target was tightly knit, but he learned the, what he learned the wife of one of the organization's senior members bore strong resentment toward them after her husband was made their scapegoat, and he managed to contact her. And because of that, he had gotten his hands on extremely important information. Nice. Hm. Kano. Good work, everyone! We've almost gathered enough proof. What Akasaka-kun brought us is particularly shocking. You must have worked hard to get it. Great work! Thank you. The small meeting room was filled with boxes that were, in turn, filled with documents. A whiteboard was filled with cramped writing, too. A few of the investigators in the meeting room, which was also filled with smoke, were reading the documents intensely. Their intimidating manner clearly indicated that they were police officers with a great deal of experience. Akasaka was one of those men. It had been a while since Mamoru Akasaka was transferred to this department. When he worked on the case of the kidnapping of Minister Inukai's grandson, 
He had been a rookie, but by now he was an experienced investigator. After a knock on the door, an elderly man entered the room. Everyone straightened up all at once. Sir, thank you for stopping by. Thank you. You don't need to stand. Relax. I brought a wonderful gift for you all today. Kano, you'll need to... You'll get to go to your son's parents' day meeting after all. The meeting room was filled with sighs tinged with exasperation and resignation. It certainly wasn't because any of them hated getting to go to parents' day. I knew it. I thought it was about time. Shit! Akasaka's colleague complained. They had been so close to getting to the root of this issue. They had such strong evidence. Akasaka, on his part, wasn't too disturbed. This has happened several times in the past, and considering how hot the documents he obtained were, it was easy enough to predict. The case was suddenly transferred to another department. That meant their investigation ended here. The new department was supposed to continue the investigation to expose injustices, but that's never happened once before. It was just an excuse. The investigation had been terminated because of pressure from above. Damn it! What about everything we've worked so for? So, bleh, yeah. It was just to see how much it hurt to push out the pus. They realized it would be too painful, so they decided not to treat the wo wound. In that sense, their hard work wasn't wasted. Because of it, the investigation was terminated. Akasaka understood that, but his colleague wasn't yet mature enough to understand. Of course, Akasaka's sense of justice was displeased by this. He felt frustrated with his superiors, who had hesitated to expose the truth. But he was mature enough to know not to say that out loud. We'll organize what we have and hand it over to the other end later. Anyway, since you haven't had a day off for a long time, you don't have to wait until 5 p.m. to leave today. Please go home and get some rest. We'll talk about what's left to do tomorrow. Also, don't forget to use up your vacation time, too. Make sure you take a vacation and give a treat to your spouses. Please come with me. That will be all. Yes, sir. Though his long, secret investigation left a bad taste in his mouth with its resolution, he managed to earn a holiday until the next incident arrived. Well, I guess we'll do as he says. Everyone, go home and get some rest. If you go home that early, you might find out your wife is having an affair, you know? Dumbass, you don't know anything. Akasaka-san and his wife are madly in love. He calls her every night from a public phone in a different building. Oh, I envy you, Akasaka. My wife is pretty cold. <laughs> Akasaka smiled bitterly as he gathered the documents in his hands. One of the pages fell to the floor. It was a page from a huge pile of papers documenting illegal expenditures. They exposed the illegal expenditures of the Alphabet Project, the research team for the next generation of hardware in the defense agency. It was entirely possible that this project was created in the first place for the purpose of funneling these illegal expenditures. When he saw the paper, one thing caught Akasaka's eye. He picked it up, looked at it, and tried to remember. It was, yeah, it was a list of people who illegally received public funds. It was also a list of retirees who were still very much in love with money. There should have been no connection between those people and Akasaka. However, there was one thing that caught his attention. The Urie Clinic. As soon as he said it, all sorts of memories resurfaced. Okay, so... Are we in 85 again? This is... It's getting confusing. <laughs> yes. The Irie Clinic. When he was working on the case of Minister Inukai's grandson's abduction, he got into a scuffle with the suspects and became injured. He was taken to the local clinic. As he recalled, the name of that clinic was the Irie Clinic. He started to remember one thing after another. His very first experience with wading into the muck. It was burnt into his mind like a fresh memory, and he could vividly recall everything that happened. Oh wait, no! We're totally in 83, because his wife's alive. I'm stupid. 
His daughter was about to be born, and he really didn't want to go to Hinamizawa. He met Oishi, who taught him a lot of important things. He also met a girl in that village. Her name was... yes. Rika Furude. That was it. How long had it been? How old was she now? As he remembered her lovely smile, he also remembered the ominous prediction she made. She had predicted that if he didn't go back to Tokyo, something terrible would happen. At the time, he took it as nonsense, but he felt something odd about it, as if it was a divine omen. Then he had remembered Yukie, who was about to give birth. He became concerned that something terrible would happen to her. But he couldn't just leave and go back to Tokyo. That's why he called her right away. He told her something would happen. He told her to be very careful until he returned. Yukie had laughed and told him he was being paranoid. But that phone call indeed saved her from a calamity. Akasaka had found out about that when he visited her after returning to Tokyo. A few days after his phone call, a janitor was seriously injured when he stepped on a loose tile on the stairs on his way to the rooftop. He also heard afterwards that Yukie had a habit of going up to the roof for a walk every day. But because of his phone call, she had stopped doing it. If he hadn't called her, she would have been the one to step on the loose tile. In other words, Rika Furude's prediction had been correct. There was no proof, but Akasaka still believed that he was able to save Yukie only because of Rika Furude's prediction. He'd intended to call and thank her for saving Yukie, but the busy days that followed put it out of his mind. Rika-chan. He wondered if she was still doing well, if she was still smiling. Akasaka remembered the sad prediction she made on that night under the moon, while still wearing that smile. That's right. She'd said something. She predicted someone would get killed on the night of the festival every year, and that on the fifth year in, she'd be the one to get killed. That's right, he thought. She did say that. The fifth year. That's this year! The festival is... That's right, it's in June. If he remembered correctly, it happens on the last Sunday of the month. Akasaka looked at the calendar. It was June 1983. Although there was still some time, the death she predicted for herself was coming up. The girl who'd predicted Yukie's accident also prophesied the mysterious incident would occur annually for the next five years. If they'd actually been happening, then it would happen again this year. Akasaka wondered if Oishi was still at the Okinomiya PD. If the annual incident she predicted actually was taking place, he would know. In other words, he could confirm if Rika Furude was going to be killed or not with a phone call to Oishi. The girl who predicted her own death had muttered that she didn't want to die. Muttered? No. It was clearly a plea for help. A young girl who was trapped in the fathomless, bizarre traditions of a village she couldn't escape had sought help from him, an outsider. She paid his reward in advance, in the form of foreseeing Yukie's accident. He had to get to her. He had to go save her. A flood of emotions filled him up. He felt as though he had finally remembered something he was never supposed to forget. But wait, hold on. How did Rika... Like, obviously the reason Rika was able to make that prediction in Himatsubushi and eventually have it, I'm assuming, become a constant over every fragment. How did she learn of Yukie's death in the first place in a previous fragment? Like, <laughs> obviously she would have died in 81, but... Does that mean... No, it would have been 80. Right? Because the form... Yeah, it was 1980, I'm pretty sure. So... Obviously... No, wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I literally can't fucking remember. Fourth year curse was 82. Third in, in 81. Second in 80. So it was 1978. I'm just bad at counting. I was counting down from 85, not from 83. So... 
how did she ever learn that Yukie does die? Because Akasaka goes back, then learns that Yukie is dead. So what, does she just ask Oishi, hey, how's Akasaka doing? And he's like, oh, his wife is dead. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> that feels a little hard to believe, but okay. That's right. He had to go to Hinamizawa. He had to save the girl who asked him for help. Unless maybe there was a fragment where, like, she went back with Akasaka. Eh. Hello, Okonomiya PD! Hello. Is uh, Kuraldo Oishi still working in your investigation department? If he is, may I talk with him, please? Excuse me, may I ask who's calling? Uh, could you tell him it's Akasaka from the police headquarters? Oishi was a very lively person, but he had been old even back then. Maybe he had already transferred somewhere else, or maybe he'd since retired. But if he was still there, he'd be happy to hear from Akasaka. He sure had a unique laugh. <laughs> Oishi-san! There's a phone call for you! Someone from the police headquarters in Tokyo. Tokyo? Who could that be? Hello, this is Oishi. What? The my oh my! And how have you been? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't expect that to end there. Well, I guess that's the end of this episode. Kidding. We're only half an hour in. Don't you worry. Are we gonna get any tips this chapter or not? It didn't say there's new tips. Achievement unlocked, though. The first miracles, and it's a picture of Hanyu's uh, eyeball. Yeah, there's no tips. Are there gonna be tips? I mean, if there's not gonna be, then... Okay. Maybe there already were, was, and I can't remember. Doesn't matter. Okay, we're at the shrine. Hanyu has already grown used to being around us. Since Rika-chan and Satoko are her age, she's become especially close with them. Of course, Rena and Mion are looking after her too. Rena told me something the day Hanyu joined the class. She said that Hanyu had been close to us for a long time, and that she's been watching us play, that she always wanted to join us. I still can't remember seeing her before, but somehow, I can believe it. Hanyu has accepted all the things that surprised me at first, as if she knew about them all along. She knows everything about us, and it seems she's truly excited about finally being able to join in. Hanyu's definitely part of our group now. She sure is. It almost feels like she's been one of us this whole time. That can't be true, though. No, it is. She's been by our side all this time. Huh? Are you saying that now, too? Rena told me that a couple days ago. Is it just that I didn't notice? It's because you're dense, Keiichi. Meep. <laughs> Fine, so what if I'm dense? Ow, ow, ow. Why are you two sitting down? Are you tired? Okay, I'm gonna change the sprites just to see, because... Why not? <laughs> Okay, where's the sprites? Remake. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes more sense. That makes a lot more sense. Alright. Why did they ever... That's a very fucking weird artistic choice, but... Whatever. I, I think, from what I remember, she is, like, s supposed to be slightly taller than Rika, but, like, not this much. <laughs> you never feel tired, Hanyu. Meanwhile, we're exhausted. It's because I've waited so long to be able to play with you all. This isn't nearly enough. I'm gonna play more and more. Ow, ow, ow. <laughs> You're full of energy. Uh, by the way, those things on your head, don't they fall off when you play? Huh? Hanyu has horns on her head. I thought that it was a hair accessory of sorts, so I didn't want her to lose it while playing. I was going to offer to hold it for her while she ran around. But Hanyu's face clouded over, and she apologetically held on to the horns. Keiichi, Hanyu can't take them off. Eh? 
Ah, I see. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, is it strange to have horns? <laughs> no, not at all. I think it's cute. Yeah, K-Chan even has a horn between his legs, don't you? No, it's hard and curved back. That would be weird if it was true. <laughs> what kind of horn is between his legs? What kind? These are children. Renaissance Punch is still the one thing I can't follow. Are you quite alright, Mion-san? There's a depression in your face. Everyone laughed except Hanyu, who didn't seem to get it. I shouldn't have said anything. I bet she doesn't like to talk about her horns. But if I try to apologize, I think things will get even more complicated. As I thought about what to say, Rena took the girls over to the shrine gate. Don't worry about it, Keiichi. Hanyu tries not to let it bother her, but she hasn't had enough training. Meep. So she doesn't like to talk about them, huh? Uh, sorry, I'll be more careful. Hanyu came to Hinamizawa a very long time ago. She did? No wonder she knows so much about the village. I don't know where she lived before she came here. I asked her once, but... All she said was it was a place I wouldn't understand. Hanyu said that she, or rather Hanyu's people, couldn't live there anymore. They looked for a new place to live for a long time. They traveled a very long way before arriving in Hinamizawa. There was a beautiful swamp in the area, and that was exactly what Hanyu's people were looking for. But there was a village nearby where people lived. To show respect to the original inhabitants of an area was law among wandering people like Hanyu's. Her clan decided to live peacefully and coexist with the villagers. However, their attempts to coexist didn't go so well. The villagers were too childish and immature to accept these newcomers. They strongly, strongly rejected them and caused a terrible, terrible disaster. Hanyu said she took their form and descended upon this land in order to subdue the disaster. However, she just couldn't hide her horns. The forbidden ancient documents say that Hanyu descended into the Furude Shrine, appearing as she does today. It also states the following. Hanyu's people can't live anywhere other than this village. They can, al they can also only live by coexisting with the villagers. The Furude Shrine's pri priest once rejected them, claiming that coexistence was impossible if mixing with the wandering people's blood caused the villagers to become demons. But the young heir of the Furude Shrine fell in love with Hanyu, and when their child was born, the priest had to reconsider. The wandering people who cannot hide your horns. If you wish to settle in this land, if you wish to settle with our blood, then I shall consider granting your wish. However, as the demon's blood mixed with the villagers, it became hard to tell who was human and who was demon. The villagers began to cast suspicion on one another, haunted by that paranoia. Salem Witch Trials coming through, except Salem D Hinamizawa Demon Trials, Onigafuchi Demon Trials. <laughs> Unless all of that was resolved, coexistence would be impossible. For you and us to coexist, we must lay down several laws for us to follow. They will be very strict. I am very, very sorry for imposing these upon you who have lived in peace until now. Wait, hold on. This might be a dumb fucking joke to make, but didn't it say... Yeah, the young heir of the Fruite Shrine fell in love with Hanyu, and when their child was born, the priest had to reconsider. So then in that case... I probably have to screw up a little bit. Um, everyone laughed except for Hanyu, who didn't seem to get it. You're not fooling me, game. <laughs> sorry, dumb joke. They'll be very strict. I am very, very sorry for imposing these upon you who have lived in peace until now. However, as long as those rules are followed, the village will be free from demonic disaster. Unless she just, you know, lost her memories as time went on, which makes some sense, I guess. 
Very well, the rules will be followed. But much blood has already been shed in the village. The anger, sins, and corruption people bear cannot be cleansed. The one law of the human world is that sins are atoned for with life. I see. If you say it's your way to let someone take on all responsibility and bury the sins with him, then we'll do that. However, wouldn't people end up pushing responsibility on each other because nobody wants to die? Exactly. That's the ugly demon in the world of man. No one will accept their own sins, but only foist them onto each other. Since they can only clear the balance with their lives, everyone refuses to pay, and the sins just keep adding up. Without cleansing them, they stagnate, and people cast them upon each other forever, doubting each other and passing them around. I see. If that is the unopposable law of this world, and you yourselves are troubled by this law, then in exchange for coexisting with us, I shall grant you a world where people do not blame their sins on each other. What kind of world is it? So long as mankind exists, they will commit sins and give rise to corruption. How could that all be erased without foisting it onto someone else? Let me bear all the sins and corruption born from man, and purify my soul. Let all sins rest not with man. If they are born upon myself, then man will not need to force them on each other. What are you saying? Are you really going to make yourself into a sacrifice? Someone has to take on the sins, otherwise they won't be cleansed. That's the law of your world, isn't it? So Hanyu is essentially Hinamizawa's Jesus. Got it. <laughs> A different ancient document also states the following. Of course, it's a forbidden one, too. Only the head of the Frude family is allowed to read it. Nobody else. Not even the other heads of the three families. It tells that unrest grew in people's minds. That the villagers' evil hearts collected in the swamp and gave rise to demons. The Frude Shrine's priest explained that the root of all evil is the demon god of the swamp and led the young villagers there. By the swamp, they found a demon mocking the unrest in people's hearts. The young villagers fought bravely, captured the demon, and dragged it to the Frude Shrine. The priest cleansed the demon god, opened her abdomen, and dragged out her organs. He chopped them up and washed them down the stream, then threw the body in the swamp. Then people regained their sanity. Those who had been suspicious of each other became friendly, and they all shared in the joy of peace again. If these forbidden ancient documents are real, then the object of the villagers' worship, Oyashiro-sama, was captured by the villagers, forced to bear all their sins, and torn to death. Plus, it's clearly written that the demons appeared after unrest grew in people's hearts. In other words, the demons were forced to bear the sin of discord that rusted with man long before they arrived. Oyashiro-sama was a god who took on people's sins to mend conflicts between them. People eventually came to honor her, and it's said that became the foundation of faith in Oyashiro-sama. I don't understand exactly what that means, but I know one thing. When none of us humans would draw the losing straw, she offered to draw it in our stead. To prove it, we cleanse our filth by letting cotton absorb it and drift it down the stream during the Watanagashi festival. There's no shame or shifting responsibility involved. Until that system was created, we were simply demons who pushed our filth and our responsibility on each other. We can only cleanse our own sins by blaming someone else and sacrificing him by cutting open his abdomen. And Hanyu took on that job. A purification ceremony without a human life. A system that forgives people for their sins. That is the origin of the cult of Oyashiro-sama, which blames not people for their sins, but the curse. Those documents were sealed away. If they weren't, people would find out that the object of their own faith was falsely blamed and killed by their own ancestors. Hanyu apologizes. She takes in people's sins and keeps apologizing. 
When people can't deal with their own sins anymore, she accepts them. When Hanyu takes over, people are cleansed, and they are allowed to keep living. Demons take on sins by becoming cotton to absorb them. They are exterminated and washed down the stream, and then the village is forgiven. They are forgiven for their sins. If that's all true, then Hanyu, or rather, Oyashiro-sama, is such a tragic existence. I've asked Hanyu about this before. Then she told me the following story. Four people are stuck in a snowy mountain cabin. They play a game where each sit in one of the four corners. It's a fairly well-known story. It's in the middle of winter. They're all getting sleepy. If they fall asleep, they'll die. So one of them comes up with an idea. They're sitting in the four corners of the room. So someone just has to walk clockwise to the next corner and wake up the person sitting in that corner. The one who just walked will sit in that corner, and the one who just woke up will get up, walk to the next corner, and wake up the person sitting there. If they keep doing that, nobody will fall asleep. People who know this story won't need an explanation, but this doesn't work with four people. When the first person gets up, their corner becomes empty. So after everyone takes turns, the fourth person goes to the next corner, which is an empty one. They sit down and fall asleep, so the game is over right there and everyone freezes to death. In other words, to play this game, you need more than four people. You need one more person in order to be saved. People usually tell this as a ghost story. They usually say that this was actually a group of five people, but one was already dead. And thanks to that ghost, they're able to continue living until the next morning. Hanyu once told me that she's like that fifth person. If she can make everything run smoothly by joining a circle of people, then... It's very similar to how the telephone game in the mountain cabin manages to function without breaking. Hanyu can complete a circle that can't be realized by people alone. Then those people can live peacefully. She's an existence that completes a circle. Is she bothered by her horns because it reminds her of the time when she was called a demon and punished for the sins she took in? Is her subconscious still tormenting her with thoughts that those who have horns ought to be persecuted? She was born with those horns. She was hated and abused because of them. Really? I definitely shouldn't have said anything, huh? We'll use Rika's duper voice, I guess. That, uh, I just hit my mic. It just makes more sense. And just because she has those horns, she had to take in everyone's sins and cleanse them. She did that, and then she was worshipped as a god. Huh? A god? I was talking to myself. Forget about it. Huh? <laughs> Nobody knows who Hanyu really is. Is she really a divine existence that descended from a higher place? Or is she simply an unlucky girl who became a sacrifice just because she had a pair of horns? Nobody knows. But this girl's blood was blended with the Frude family's blood. And that blood has descended into me. Our, our legends state that if the Frude family has a girl for their firstborn child for eight generations in a row, that eighth child will be a reincarnation of Oyashiro-sama. I don't know exactly what that means, but I'm that eighth generation. Is that why I was the only person who could see Hanyu? Eight generations is a very long time. Maybe that's how long it took for all the sins Hanyu assumed to be cleared. Eight represents infinity. It's a very lucky number. Often curses uttered will contain, I'll curse you for seven generations, but the eighth lies beyond that. In other words, eight possesses such good fortune that it can forgive great curses and sins that span seven generations. It's a number with power. It's the time Hanyu needed to cleanse all the sins she took in from the humans. It's also the number chapter we're on. Hanyu and her people simply wanted to coexist with us. But Hanyu had to become a sacrifice. Her stomach was cut open and its contents washed down the stream. 
Then she was thrown into the swamp. And so, the Frude family has been waiting. They waited for a very long time for her to come back. They kept our traditions alive, waiting forever and ever for her return. According to legend, the name Ferude was made by adding a horn to the character for Fortune Teller. The Ferude family rose when Hanyu's bloodline was combined with that of, hum of human beings. Hanyu is the ancestor of the Ferude family, as well as the mother of us all. When I was little, Hanyu taught me a lot more things than my mother did. It's no wonder. I'm her descendant. The curse on the clan who exercised and buried their very own mother was finally absolved after eight generations, what seemed like eternity. And then she met me, her descendant, the final generation of the Frude family. Sometimes when I think about that, I feel like there must be some important meaning to this hapless fate thrust upon me. But what kind of meaning could the trial I face, the trial of breaking through the obstacles sealing my fate, have upon the curse that plagued Hanyu and the Frude family for over a millennium? A thousand years is simply too long a period to communicate thoughts and intentions correctly. Hanyu has become the curse we call Oyashiro-sama. Though she originally was a means of salvation, she has become a chain that binds people. The rules about coexisting were misinterpreted as a law that binds villagers to this place, and that continued until the Meiji era. And while the village winds once again blow toward the misunderstanding of isolation thanks to the dam conflict, how does that play into my meeting with Hanyu and this motley fate we're trapped in? I haven't lived long enough to be able to understand that. The only thing I can say for sure is that the Frude family originated when Hanyu's bloodline mixed with that of humans, and the line's final descendant, me, finally met with its ancestor. The Frude bloodline bears a cursed history of placing all a man's sins onto its mother and killing her. Now, the beginning and end of that line have met. Hanyu always wanted to join everyone, yet she couldn't hide her horns. Even so, she still wished to be in existence that completes a circle. It's a child's job to bury their parents. But mother, I've never heard that it's a child's job to kill and bury their parents. Don't ask, child. I'm not human. My horns are proof that I'm a demon. A demon's job is to take on the calamities of the human world. Bearing the calamities of this chaotic world and cleansing the unrest in mankind's hearts is my role. Then mother, why do you have to be the one? People's sins are people's sins. They aren't yours. Listen, child. People live with their sins. They can't live without making someone else take the blame. Nobody wants to take the blame, so they shift that responsibility around. That is a demon. The true demon disrupting the world of man. By bearing it myself, man may be cleansed, and mankind can be freed from their destiny of doubt and conflict. Let all the sins, the filth, the karma, and the curse come to me. Then attack me, purify me, wash me down the stream, and throw me in the swamp. A human will not do, so it is the fate of one not human to accept that role. If a human were made to bear it, then mankind would not be freed from the demon of doubt. I don't understand. I don't understand, Mother. Mother, you have horns. Are you saying that you aren't human just because you have horns? That even if you are human, the horns make you non-human? Even if you have horns, you're human to me. My child, you're the only one who's ever said that. Even if everyone else calls me XXXX or XXXX, you'll still call me human. What is passed down in the Frude's many forbidden scrolls, the ones unknown to even the heads of the three families, sealed in the altar in the shrine storage, understanding that would probably require about as much time as I've spent repeating time. Yet once you understand that, Perhaps you'll better understand the smile Hanyu wears as she innocently plays with everyone. Ah! Oh, 
are you okay? I heard Mio yell in surprise. Something must have happened. What is it? What's going on? Hanyu-san tripped and tumbled down the hill over there. Hanyu-chan! Are you okay? She rolled beautifully, but I hope she didn't sprain her ankle or anything. Great, Mion. <laughs> Let's go look! Hanyu had been playing on the slope and tumbled down it. There's a road just below the slope. Mion and the others went down the stairs to get to her. Let's go. I hope she isn't injured. Oh, hey. When I got there, I saw Tomatake-san and Takano-san. They were taking care of her. What happened? We just saw her roll down the hill. She did tumble beautifully, though. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. But I think she hit her head, so I'm sure she'll get a bump later. Make sure you put some ice on it, okay? Hanyu? Hanyu? Can you hear us? Look, how many fingers did you see? She sounded disoriented, but didn't appear to be injured. What a relief for everyone. I bet she's just feeling dizzy from rolling. Hi, I'm glad. I'm glad you're not hurt. Just think, though. How lucky of you to have a nurse waiting for you down here. What perfect timing. Well, when I'm not working, I'm a wild bird photographer. Right, Jiro-san? Well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> the Hinamizawa kid would never get hurt from something like that. In other words, you're already one of us, Hanyu. Hanyu-chan? Is that your name? I've never seen you before. Are you new around here? Yes, she is. She transferred in just last Monday. It's been a week and you guys have done jack shit. You've just been messing around? <laughs> Whatever. What are these? How peculiar. Are they some kind of toy? Takano-san tried to poke at one of Hanyu's horns. They'd be an interesting hair accessory if they were an accessory. <laughs> That's what's cute about Hanyu-chan. Uh, please don't touch them, though. Oh, is that so? I don't think they're that cute, though. After all, they look just like a... monster, oh. Don't they? No. Oh. Suddenly Hanyu moaned as if suffocating. Takano, Hanyu isn't a monster. Don't ever say that again. Uh, that's right, Takano-san. That was mean. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to be rude. Rika-chan said it rather firmly. I'm sure Hanyu doesn't want to hear that word. Sometimes Takano-san says things in a derogatory way without realizing it herself. But I guess there are things you can't or shouldn't say. Hanyu was looking at Takano-san with a complicated look on her face. After seeing that expression, Takano-san realized she might have hurt her feelings. She apologized and left with Tomatake-san. Are you okay? Hanyu? You landed beautifully too, so you're not injured. Everyone keeps saying that. Hmm. Rika? That person... Ow, ow. Her? That's Takano. Takano? Takano? Hanyu repeated Takano-san's name. All of a sudden, I grew worried that she hit her head or something. So, Rika, you didn't even remember? Like, your whole point in fucking sticking out the live dissection of Mina Garoshi was to remember that Takano killed you and you didn't. Which makes sense, because she killed you rather quick, but still, good job, I guess. Hanyu stood straight up and grabbed Rika-chan's collar. Rika! Ow, ow, ow! It's Takano! 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 That's right, she's Takano. No, Rika! Takano! Takano! Don't you remember? I know. 
Mio Takano, right? From the Irie Clinic? You can't remember? Sorry, Hanyu. What are you talking about? Rika, this can't be. This is the last one. The last one! She finally imprinted herself with the true enemy's name while enduring the pain of her stomach being cut open. And yet she can't remember. Rika Furude has failed to inherit the memory of the fragments. Oof. Hey, perfect, I'm at an hour. <laughs> Thanks, game! <laughs> I'll take that! Alrighty, well, it's an interesting twist. Ah, we're at the, what is this building? Police station. Oh, we're gonna be back with Akasaka and Oishi. Yay. Uh, but we'll be back with them next episode. I'm less tired now. That's good. I have enough energy to play Deltarune. I'm recording out of order today because I don't fucking know. I just wanted to do this first. Uh, then, yeah, I got nothing else to say. So that's gonna be it for this episode, guys. If you liked it, then be sure to press the like button. And if you didn't like it, then fuck you too. Remember to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and hit that notification bell to stay up to date on all my videos and stuff. And as always, my name is Godzi, and I will see you all next time. Goodbye! Yeah.